my screen share up and we'll get going. Oops, there it is. All right, oops, uh, looks like, sorry, my gain on my mic looks a little low. I'm just gonna check that real quick. Nope, it's all the way up. <laughs> okay, that's just on the recording. Let me get that on OBS. Check, 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 test, 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 check. Okay, that looks better, okay. All right, so Last time we left off on dictionaries and we're just going through this data structures uh, slide. There's a link to that in the Slack channel. So what I wanna do today is kind of try and go and uh, reinforce some concepts um, and I'll do a couple of polls uh, at some point and we'll figure out what concepts we need to reinforce. So um, maybe range or loops or while loops, um, things like that. Maybe we can build a couple functions. Um, but today we're mostly gonna be reinforcing dictionaries and I'm hoping to get through sets and tuples in the last half of class today. Okay, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, sorry, <laughs> okay, overview. Let's do the overview. So we've got data types. Now, I've spoken with a couple people in class um, who I've gone over this overview with. And, um, oops, iteration. I can't, I evidently can't speak and type at the same time. I'm trying to do it, but it's, it's beyond me. Okay. Um, I've talked with uh, multiple people who who needed some help um, kind of reconstructing this, you know? So um, if, you know, if you're hearing me say this, I'm, you know, I'm not calling you out, this multiple people have needed help with this and that's okay. Um, I do repeat it at the beginning of every class or most classes because for me, these concepts needed to be, like I just needed to be exposed to these concepts a lot. Uh, before they landed, um, I was not pro taught programming with with this specific uh, schema. I wasn't given any schema at all. I was just kind of like, here's some stuff, figure it out. Um, so, which was you know kind of okay in its in its way. But uh, after after I learned programming and became competent, I uh, I was working on a project that I had been. Uh, pretty intensely working on. This is actually when I was in Galvanize. And um, I've been pretty intensely working on it for uh, days at that point. You know, I was like four days into a week and a half long project or something. And um, I just had this sense of like, oh, you know, everything I'm doing is writing functions and I'm just checking conditions inside of loops and manipulating types in various ways, uh, the data types in various ways, mostly in accumulator patterns. You know, if you think about an accumulator pattern, it's more or less all of these things, depending on, on the pattern. A basic accumulator pattern doesn't really involve control flow, but a slightly advanced one does. If there's anything happening inside the, the loop, it's probably a condition of some sort somewhere. So just after coding a lot, I it just kind of dawned on me that 
this was the set of things that, that I was doing. Um, and then when I came into a teaching role, I thought this would be good for you all. So you have a sense of how everything fits together. So if, um, if you're listening to this, <laughs> um, you know, take, take the time and write this down, um, write this down in your notes. Uh, I do recommend that you take notes in your text editor. Um, so like in, a, in an editor like this in REPL, you can save files in REPL or um, whatever. So let, let your notes be part of your code. They can be comments in your code or they can be code. So um, Python is after all a self-documenting language. So anyways, um, yeah, I do feel like these are important things to be comfortable with. You want to know what your types are. You want to be able to do your abstractions, variables, and uh, functions there. Um, control flow allows you to write code that only executes in certain conditions. Means your program can be dynamic and it doesn't just do one thing every time you run it. You know, if, if you didn't have conditions, you're code would only ever do one thing. You'd write it and it would just run from start to finish with, to completion without doing anything different. You'd have to like give it different parameters and inputs every time. So control flow is important. Um, not a whole lot going on here. Just your if, elif, elif, uh, and else. Um, of course, you've got your conditions that, you know, the ifs and elifs check and conclusions, which are the, the body of code that are, 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 is uh, executed when the condition is true. Um, iteration, um, you've got two, we've covered two uh, style of, of uh, uh, loops which are for loops and while loops. So for loops, oh, maybe we'll make that a little bit of a breakout. Let's come back to that. Um, data types, you've got numbers. So that's int, float, float. Uh, bools are technically considered a numeric type, even though the values are just true and false. You got string, you've got none. And we've also talked about lists, dictionaries. And uh, today we're also going to introduce sets, which I know is a concept that you've uh, explored with Tovio in stats classes. So there's a data type in Python called a set and it, it's a set. It's what you think it is from uh, the set theory classes that Tovio has done. Um, and then we've also got list dict set uh, and tuple. And I'm putting an asterisk next to the ones that we haven't formally covered yet. I've talked about tuples several times. Um, the reason I'm not in a big rush to cover them um, is if you understand lists, you understand what a tuple is, just minus the mutable aspects. So tuples are like lists that are immutable. That's basically the deal. Um, and then sets are weird. We'll get to those. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's the overview. And it is my two cents. It's my opinion on, on, you know, the, the basics of like pure Python of core Python, you know, um, there are other elements in, in core Python that I'm not including in here, such as classes and, uh, error handling, you know, try, accept, and raise for errors and stuff, um, assert, um, formal testing. I, I talk about sort of informal testing. When I talked about workflow, I talked about sort of an informal way of testing, which is kind of an easy print style test um, for when you're writing, writing functions. You can test your functions that way. Um, but testing is a whole rabbit hole all by itself. It's a whole thing. So there's definitely more in core Python than these things, but the goal, my goal in administering this class and, and, uh, and teaching you all and, and supporting y'all's 
you know, learning of Python is to give you kind of the, the smallest set of tools that will show you like the core of solving problems with a programming language or in Python specifically, I guess. So the, the core set of tools that way, when you need to go learn object oriented programming, you have a foundation that is conducive to that. And you don't have to go back and learn all this other stuff before you can get into that. Or when you need to, when you have something that'd be really useful to use error handling with, you know, you have all these other tools to kind of support learning that and everything else kind of falls into place, or at least, you know, you can, uh, you can kind of work with more clearly. So, so that's why I do this. I do recommend that you write it down with me, code along with what I'm doing in general, even if I'm just going over notes like that. Cool. All right. So um, let's do a little breakout for this because we've talked about loops fairly recently. And we'll do this kind of as a little impromptu breakout. So I want it to be something like, what's the difference between for and while loops? Um, but I want to be more specific than that. I want it to be like, uh, Yeah, I'll do it this way. So I'll say, okay, when must uh, when must you use a while loop? Um, and when can you use a for loop? Answering one of these is kind of implicitly the negative of the other, but feel free to answer one or the other or both, however you like. So what, under what circumstances do you have to use a while loop? And under what circumstances can you use a for loop? I'm going to put just a couple minutes on the clock for this. Go ahead and just put in an answer in Slack. It can just be a sentence or something.
All right. Um, I had my microphone muted. It's great. Okay. That's why nobody could hear. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah. So which of the two loops can solve a greater variety of problems? For loops or while loops? Oh, interesting. Okay. We've got some disagreement amongst the ranks. I'll put a, a minute on the clock for this. So the question on the table is which of the two loops, for loops and while loops, which of those two can solve a greater, is suited to solve a greater variety of problems? If you're really determined, you can, um, either one can technically do the job of the other. Um, sometimes it's a stretch though. They have their strengths. And let's make a follow up to this question as well. Go ahead, we've got a, um, we've got another minute for this one. The question on the table is, which of the two loops can solve a greater variety of problems? And I'm just writing this one here. Okay, so here's the next question. And I misspelled something, okay, that's great. And here's the next one. I'm just gonna put a minute on the clock for this one. All right, final answers. Take a guess if you don't know. Why not? Okay, cool. So um, perhaps I worded this last one strangely. I was surprised that we got a lot of people, I, don't, I didn't count, but uh, it seemed almost even amount of people said for and while for, for this second question here, which of the two loops can solve a greater variety of problems? So to be clear, um, there seems to be pretty unanimous decision that for loops are considered preferable to use over while loops when possible. 
and and that is true. That is what I teach, at least. Uh, um, perhaps there's somebody out there who really prefers to use while loops um, in general, but while loops tend to be a little uh, a little hard to use at times. They're a little they're a bit much to manage, right? Um, you do get used to them. You get used to writing them. I, I don't like struggle as much. Occasionally I, I write a, a while loop that gets into an infinite loop because I write a lot more for loops than while loops um, because I avoid while loops whenever I possibly can. <laughs> so um, I do everything I can do to determine ahead of time, you know, the number of times I might need to iterate through a process or iterate through something to complete it the way you can use a for loop. So um, yeah, so while loops can be a little bit to manage, um, even if, you know, even if they're not, uh, even if you get to the point where they're not difficult to manage or difficult to write, they're a little less elegant, they're a little less nice than for loops. Um, and I think Python can make some optimizations under the hood to, to for loops that are give them a slight performance boost. Um, but at any rate, at, at any rate, um, my intended idea behind this one was that while loops are capable of solving more problems. And the reason is uh, a for loop can solve problems when you know the amount of iterations going into the loop. Um, a while loop, you can know or not know the amount of iterations necessary before going into the loop. So technically you can solve any problem that you can you can write with a or any solution you can write with a for loop uh technically you can also use a while loop but um yeah it's it's obviously it's preferable whenever you can use a for loop to use a for loop but while loops are considered more powerful they can solve a greater variety of problems So one is powerful and um, a little bit annoying to manage, and the other is still pretty powerful. Um, for loops are still quite powerful. They, they're still capable of a lot, um, but they can't do quite as much as a while loop, but they are much easier to manage. So somebody prefers infinite while loops. I, I, I see what you're I see what you're saying. <laughs> oh no, I misunderstood that that comment. Okay, cool. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see here. So let's do. I'm gonna do a little poll on how people are feeling about dictionaries. Give me one second here. Let me write the poll. Um, Now, don't put in an answer just yet. I will tell you when you can put in your answer. You'll vote on the poll by doing one, two, or three. Okay. So go ahead and just click one, two, or three. So one is is like you feel really confused about dictionaries. Um, you don't feel like you can really use them. You need a lot of help. Two is going to be um, you, you know anywhere between like I'm I can use them, but it's a struggle. To like I can use them and I okay, but it's it, I still have some questions. There's still some things I don't know. And then three is uh, you feel pretty comfortable using them. And three might be like, you have a couple questions, maybe you don't know everything about dictionaries, but like if you needed to solve a problem using a dictionary, you'd figure it out and you'd be okay, you'd be fine.
Okay, so we've got pretty well. We've got about an even split between twos and threes, and we've got some ones in there as well. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, so we need a little more practice with dictionaries, I think. Um, let's have, let's do like a little workshop. Um, let's do a five minute thing. I just put six minutes, six minutes <laughs> um, for dictionary questions. If you have specific questions, let's go over these for the next five minutes. I'll try to give real quick answers. So if you have a question about a dictionary, feel free to pop, pop it in, how to use them, what to do. Not seeing anybody typing. Maybe it's not telling me if anybody's typing. I'm not sure. Uh, how do you remove values? Um, do you ever just get keys or do you ever just get keys or just values? Um, let's look at how to do that. So removing values, let's, I'm just gonna kind of list out questions and I'm gonna take these as topics. So removing, uh, values. So we're going to, I'm just collecting topics and I'm going to go through these after the question time is over. Um, just keys or just values. Still a bit confused on how to iterate through keys. Still confused about the differences between keys and indices. Okay. Uh, differences between keys and indices. Uh, iterating. Indices are related to lists, not dictionaries. Keys are related to, yep, okay. Any other questions? Still taking questions. These are topics that I'm gonna cover once we get into things. Why would you use a dictionary versus a set and vice versa? Okay. Maybe I'll do this one last and I'll use it as a segue into sets. We can talk about sets there. Pairing keys and values from different lists. Parts is confusing to me. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what you're driving at. Pairing keys and values. You're saying from different lists. Are you saying it's like, confusing that um, like you have like a list of keys and a list of values and how those coordinate or how those relate to each other. Okay. Um, I'm going to pairing keys and values. I'll do um, so to be clear, a dictionary and I'm not quite sure if this is your understanding, but a dictionary is not a list of keys and a list of values that like associate with each other. It's um, it's one type. Think about it like, you could think about it like a, a list, but instead of numbered indices, you have named keys that you have to specify yourself. So it's still one thing, it's not two lists. But um, just, to, just to explore that, we'll do, uh, we'll do a parallel list. We'll look at parallel lists. When you make a dictionary, when I make a dictionary from two lists. Okay, I see. 
Um, oh, using zip. Okay, thank you. Making a dict from zipping to lists. There we go. Is that what you're talking about? I'm kind of getting that that's what you're talking about. Awesome. Okay, cool. We got one more minute left for dictionary topics. If you have them, we can put them in at any time too, but I just want to make sure I give people an opportunity to think about what things you specifically want to cover with dictionaries. What places are you struggling? What do you want to cover with dictionaries? Uh, when you add elements to a dictionary, do you need both the key and the value? Yes. So, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. What? Okay. Okay. All right. Excuse me. Sorry about this. I need to resize that. All right. Um, we got two more questions here. When you add elements, okay, sorry, apologies. Um, talk about orphaned keys or values, which is a term for something that's not possible in Python. There are other languages that'll let you have an orphaned key or an orphaned value. Um, how do you merge two or more dictionaries together? Move a previously merged dictionary. Um, merging and unmerging. Okay, so um, unmerging is not a thing. Um, it's not possible. If you if you take a dictionary, there is a way to have you have two dictionaries, and you can use the dot update method to extend one by the other. But there is no way to un undo that operation. Once it's done, it's done. So if you didn't want to do it, uh, save a copy of the original so you can get back to it if you need to. OK, um, good. No way to unmerge. Cool. So <clears throat> let's go through each of these. Before I do this, and I'm just going to I'm just marking this because I'll use this as a segue into talking about sets at the end. Um, so before I go through this, um, I want to make sure everybody's on board with key value pairs, this idea of key value pairs. I know there's some, you know, just judging by the questions here, there are some things that need to be clarified. But does everybody get this this concept in dictionaries, whether you fully understand it or not, you, you know that elements in dictionaries come in key value pairs. Maybe you're not sure what a key is or a value but you have this idea of key value pairs. Thumbs up or thumbs down, key value pairs. You know what, it's actually gonna be quicker if I just start from the beginning. Okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, quick recap from the beginning, dictionary. So I'm gonna make a dictionary, I'm just gonna call it D. To make an empty dictionary, I'm gonna use curly brackets and Python will know that this is an empty dictionary. Um, dictionaries are a data type somewhat in certain ways similar to lists. They are mutable like lists, meaning we can manipulate it on the, on the level of the object itself. Um, of course, we can always manipulate the pointer uh, or the variable name and how what that's pointing to in um, in any type, but with mutable types, we can manipulate the object itself. So we can manipulate the object itself with mutable 
methods and things um, just like we can with lists. Um, there are other methods, they have different names, and they maybe do some different things, but similar idea. Um, dictionaries, whereas lists hold information um, in an ordered indexed collection, dictionaries hold information and we consider dictionaries to be an unordered collection where instead of indices that are just implicitly given based on the position of an element in a list, um, instead of an index that's automatically given to each element, uh, each value has a key that you have to specify, that we have to tell the dictionary what we want that key to be. You don't necessarily have to know at the time you're writing, you can write code to determine what the key name should be, and then you can use that. Um, a dictionary key can be any immutable type. The reason for this is that keys are, every key is run through a hashing algorithm, and behind the scenes, the key is stored as a hash. Um, and if you hashed a value that was mutable and then mutated the value, then the whatever that mutated value would hash to would no longer be the key that it was originally hashed to. So if the value can change, then the hash would change and then you'd have something that no longer matches up with, with the hash behind the scenes. If all that doesn't make sense, just think about it like, um, you know, if you if you mutated, uh, if you were using a list as a key and you changed the list, um, how would you know what key to use if you have a list that could change, right? You essentially have a moving target. So um, it would be really hard to anticipate what the keys would be uh, for a dictionary and you could end up with un inaccessible information. So as a result, we only allow keys and dictionaries whose values, the value of that key can't change, right? So a string is an immutable type. I'm gonna go ahead and say most of the time, dictionary keys are strings because it's semantically useful for us to have labeled data where we can, we can label certain things uh, according to what we want. So um, we can also use integers or floats as keys. So I could have numbered keys, um, but yeah, okay. Um, that is less common to do. It's something that you will see, you know, maybe the keys could be like um, a year or something. Um, and the values could be like a list of things that happened in that year, I don't know. Um, so let's just look at a simple example. Um, why don't I make a dictionary? I'm gonna make this dictionary with key value pairs and I'm gonna call this um, my car. I'm gonna make a car dictionary. This is my perennial example that I always use. Okay, so um, let's say uh, make is, so this is make is my key. This is a key and model, or excuse me, make is a key and the make is Toyota. So um, key colon value, the key and the value are separated by a colon. And then Python knows that I'm onto the next key value pair when I hit, when I uh, write a comma and then I make another key value pair. So let's do model. I think that's how you spell model. I'm not gonna worry about it too much. Uh, make and model. Um, and let's see, a uh, year is 2011. Okay, so this could be, this could be a dictionary that represents a car, right? 
So we have each value here on the, oops, and I, this doesn't have to be a string. 2011 is a year, so that makes sense as an integer. Um, so these values here are labeled with these keys. And the way that I use the keys is a lot like the way I would use indices in a list. So I'll say my car. Um, if I want to know the make, and I'll print this out so I can see it. The make, I can say my car, then square brackets, just like you'd use with a list, my car sub make. And that's going to give me Toyota, right? Now you might think, oh, great. So if I did my car sub Toyota, you'd get make, right? It doesn't work in the other way or in the other direction, though. You can only recover the value if you know the key, right? So if you have the key, you can get the value. If you have the value, then you know you have the value and you, you can't get the key necessarily without like just iterating through the dictionary and then seeing and um, in, encountering a, a value that you want and then just finding whatever key is associated with it at that moment. But okay, <laughs> so that's how I can. I can access a value in a key. Let's see. Can, we've got a question, can two keys have the same value? Two different keys can have the same value. Um, <laughs> let's just say, I don't know, um, height and inches. I don't know if that's probably really tall or something, but um, yeah. We could, we we could do that, and then they both have the same. Okay, so there's my dictionary printed out. This is how I can access a single element. Um, let's add an element. So let's. Let's do this. Uh, color. So if I want to add something, I can say uh, my car sub color equals black. And then you can see, of course, you can't see because I'm not printing it off yet. You can see that this now has a key called color and a value called black. Um, if I want to, let's say, repaint my car, I can change my car sub color to red, right? So this is how I can assign, make a new key value pair or reassign a value to um, um, to an existing key. Um, cool. So that's kind of foundational stuff. We have making, we can make an empty dictionary like that. Uh, we can make a dictionary with some, some elements in it like this. Um, we can print the whole dictionary, print a given uh, value, given the key. Uh, we can create a new key value pair. So somebody asked about orphaned keys or values. Um, so let's just check this one off, right? We can't have keys. We can't have a key without a value, nor can we have a value without a key. They always have to come in a pair. They always have to come in a key value pair. So um, yeah, uh, we also can't have duplicate keys. So notice this syntax for adding something in is the same exact syntax as for changing something that already exists. And that's because this, both of these work the same. It's just the, the last one that I ran just overwrote the previous one. So they're both creating a new key value pair. It's just that since we can't have duplicates, the last one wins out. The last one that I made wins out. So um, 
not having duplicates gives me the ability to change the values at a given key instead, which is, in my opinion, more useful. That's the more desired behavior. Okay. Um, cool. So empty dictionary, dictionary with things in it, access a value given a key, create a new key value pair, mutate a key value or change the value of a key. Cool, which is the same as creating. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move us forward. I'm hoping everybody is good uh, to that point at least. Oops. I'm sorry. Um, when would turning a dictionary into a list be useful? <sighs> It depends uh, if you if you want to preserve the key val the keys and values together, then you could do a list of tuples. Um, that would be useful if if you want to associate keys with values, but you also want the key value order to matter, or you want to manipulate the key value order in some way. Since there's no way to do that in a dictionary, but there is a way to do that in a list, right? So if it, if I really had to have year for whatever reason, be the first thing that I was using in the, some, some process that I was doing, um, I might convert it to a list of tuples so that uh, I could control the order of that list of tuples and put each tuple in the order that I wanted and each tuple would contain a key value pair. So sometimes you will see um, dictionaries, you will see lists of tuples as kind of analogs for dictionaries for problems when you need a dictionary, but order also still matters. Um, but that's not common. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. I should have picked Supra, <laughs> okay. Um, what if there are two values and you want only the first value. Um, I'm not sure what that means. It, could you could you clarify that question? Uh, and I'll come back to it. Um, what about syntax makes the dictionary mutable? Uh, it's not the syntax. Well, okay, this is this is a mutation of the dictionary. We're adding in a, a key value pair that wasn't there before. This is the analog to an append. Uh, this is like appending is to list as this is for dictionaries. So when you're when you're doing an append, you're adding in a, an element, but that element also uh, implicitly gets uh, an index associated with it. So when you're adding in an element into a key, you're adding in a, a uh, or excuse me, when you're adding in an element to a list, you're adding in a uh, an element, an index element pair. But you, you just don't have to worry about the index because it's automatically done for you. Whereas with dictionaries, you have to kind of manage that. So this is like an append. So this is a mutable operation. Uh, are dictionaries like sets because dictionaries don't have duplicate keys? Uh, there is an analogy to be made there. They are pretty different from sets. Sets, I think, are the furthest outlier in terms of their use case. Um, a lot of problems that you can solve with a list, you can solve with a dictionary, you can solve with a tuple. You know, a lot of problems that you can solve with one, you can, you might have to reimagine it a little bit, but you can solve it with the other. Lists and tuples and dictionaries are surprisingly interchangeable. Um, some some particular um, situation may be 
really strange to deal with um, in one of those types and really easy to deal with in another one. But, you know, you can kind of, with some reimag some slight reimagining, you can kind of use lists and tuples and dictionaries interchangeably. Um, sets don't have much common in common in terms of their use case at all with those three. They, their use case is pretty different. And I'll, I'll get to that. Um, uh, I'll kind of cover why that is. It'll, it'll become it'll become obvious. Uh, cool. So let's go through removing values. Um, removing values. So I've got this dictionary. Let's say I want to remove height and inches 2011 because I, I don't really know how how many inches tall this car is. So um, let's say I'll say my car sub. So uh, oh, actually, I used to use Dell for this, and I think I like to use pop now. Pop, porp, pop. So um, dot pop will remove a key value pair given that you know the key that you want to remove. So you can see, let's do a before and after snapshot. There you go. So height and inches, dot pop height and inches, and then since I removed the key, the value is also gone too. Or this is actually saying remove the key value pair with this key. Um, just keys or just values. So I think this relates to, I'm gonna do this with iterating through dictionaries because that's kind of what occurs to me when I think of just keys or just values. So when you're working with a dictionary, um, you might think, oh, I just need to deal with the keys or I just need to deal with the values. So there are two methods uh, associated with this. Fortunately, they're called dot keys and dot values. So let's do my car dot keys. Let's print that. And my car dot values. So the keys are make, model, year, height, and inches. Oh, I thought I, oh, I, I was like, I thought I removed that. Let's do that. I'm going to remove that. I'm going to make the color black. OK. Make, model, year, color. Um, and the values are Toyota, Highlander, 2011, and black. So that's keys and values. Um, there's another method, which is items. Um, and just notice here that the, the way that these are being printed out kind of makes them look like lists, but you see you have dict keys, dict values, dict items. So let me just make this nice and clear. I'll cast these as lists like this. So you can see them in their pure list form. And if I actually call the type of these, you can see the type of my car dot keys is dict keys. The type of values is dict values and the type of items is dict items. So these are actually, each of these methods actually return their own type, but they end up behaving a lot like lists. Um, they're not they're not mutable to my knowledge. I don't know why they would be. Um, I, I've never needed them to be. If I need them to be a list, I just cast them as a list. So um, then the list is mutable. So this actually answers somebody else's question from earlier about like when would we cast, I guess this isn't when, but this is how we would cast a dictionary to a list. So these are three ways we could cast a dictionary to a list, um, or three aspects about a dictionary that we could cast to a list. Um, if I wanted only a list of keys, keys, values, items. It's more likely that you'll use any of these while iterating. However, um, when you're iterating through a dictionary, at least for now, what what you shouldn't do is sit there and spend really any time thinking unless it's just obvious 
uh, like instantaneously. Um, don't spend any time thinking about once you need to, once you know you need to iterate through a dictionary. Don't spend any time thinking about uh, should I iterate through just the keys or just the values. Just iterate through the items. Like I said, unless it's perfectly clear that you need to iterate through just the keys or just the values, you're not going to do yourself any you're not going to hurt anything by just iterating through the items. Um, so if I said for uh, k comma v in my car dot items, I'll print k comma v. Yeah, come on, v. And there we can iterate through the keys and values simultaneously. So if you recall, um, the way enumerate zip dictionary dot items. Um, changes the for loop in terms of it allows us to to name two things, um, two things. And the reason it allows us to do that is uh, because it actually gives us a tuple back. So if I only name one thing, it'll be the tuple. This gives us a list of tuples. And like a list, I can unpack a tuple. I can unpack a tuple anywhere I would give it a name. I would be giving it a name. It would be getting its identifier name, its variable name from this for loop. So I can just unpack that tuple in place into key and value and it'll turn this into, oops, this. So that gives me a, you know, a, a variable name for the key and a variable name for the value. Um, of course, I could call this anything I wanted, key. Val. There we go. Cool. Um, differences between keys and indices. I touched on this a moment ago, but let's go over it again. So, um, list is a list. Okay. Um, so we have some keys and values here. No, excuse me. We have some uh, indices and elements here. But with a list, all you see is the elements because the indices are just a given. We just take it at face value that this list has indices. The indices are free in the sense that um, I don't have to do anything to make them exist they're just they're just a given we can take them as uh, uh, we can take them for granted because they are granted they're just always going to be there so every time i add something to a list it's going to have um it's going to get an index if i remove elements from a, a list the uh the elements after um the element that i removed um, are going to have their index be associated with new indices uh, because the index just describes the ordered position, um, the ordinal position relative to the start of the list, right? Um, starting at zero, right? So we start with the first index being zero, second index being one, etc. cetera. Um, so a, a list's index is a way of navigating its elements based on their ordinal position relative to each other, based on their order, right? Uh, dictionary. Poodle. Uh, um, Let's do this. B. Now you can stick a dictionary on one line. I like to break it across multiple lines because it's just easier to read that way. Okay. 
Um, a dictionary, we have to specify the keys whenever we whenever we add in elements, right? So if I want to add in this value of poodle, I have to say what its location is. So I have to give it give that locale a name, uh, which is a key. So the key A corresponds with the value poodle. The key B corresponds with the value sandwich. The key C corresponds with the value banana. So this is obviously just silly random stuff uh, that I'm thinking about. So print DCT. Okay. So in terms of differences between keys and indices, their, their purpose is very much, their purpose is very much the same, but the way they deliver that purpose, if you will, um, is different. So with indices, indices are automatically given. They're always uh, an ordinal number for starting at zero and going up. We can use negative indices and we'll just count from the right to the left. We'll just count backwards basically. Um, with uh, with keys you have names given to each value that is associated with it and the idea is that it's a mechanism like an index by which you can retrieve a specific value right so Instead of them being implicitly given, we have to supply them ourselves. Um, but the idea is that if I wanted to know what the third element is, I could say list sub three. If I wanted to know what the uh, what the value of the C key is, I could say dict sub C. So that's the idea. Notice the syntax is like the same, you know, it's square brackets and then the locator, right? Like you either have an index locator to find the element that you want, or you have a, a key locator to find the, uh, the value that you want. So, okay. Do feel free, y'all, to ask questions as I go through this stuff. Um, I know I'm kind of going quickly, but um, you're always welcome to throw in questions, um, especially if you're you're the person who who asked any given one of these. I'm I'm just hoping that these explanations are, are landing. Uh, I'm going to move on from that, and we'll we'll go on to this. So, uh, pairing keys and values, uh, making a dict from zipping two lists. Okay. Um, let's do, let's do this. I wonder if there's an unzip. Hmm. I'll have to look into that. Um, oops. Oh, what am I doing? This is this is just a silly dictionary. I don't need to use that dictionary. Um, let's do the car dictionary. That's less silly, much less silly. So let's say we'll do color as color is um, So let's say I had two lists. Oh, come on. Don't do this. 
this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll do that and we'll do that. Somehow that got messed up. Okay, whatever. All right. Get rid of that and that. Oh, that would have been way faster to just do that from scratch, but okay, whatever. Whew, okay. So I've got list one, which was my keys and list two, which was my values. And uh, I wanna zip those into a dictionary. The reason I keep saying zip is because that's the function that we use. So if I wanna turn these two lists into a dictionaries, into a dictionary, I can do uh, zip. Um, let's do list one, comma, list two. Now, I'm going to print this off and we'll kind of work our way towards it. So notice it just gives me a zip object initially, because that's what zip gives back. Now that is an iterable object. You can loop through it and everything, do it, whatever kind of loopy thing you want to it. Um, so I could cast this to a list and I would get a list of tuples. And you remember what else gives us a list of tuples when we cast it to a list? It's gonna be your dot items. All right, so dot items also gives back a list of tuples. So anytime you see these, this sort of pattern of uh, a list of two wide tuples, you know, or a list of tuples where each tuple has two elements contained inside of it, um, you can basically cap, uh, think about that as a dictionary. So we can cast that as a dict. Okay, so zip list one, list two, and then we pass zip to dict, just casting it as a dict, and that'll turn it into a dictionary. Um, orphan key values, we talked about that. Um, merging two dictionaries, so let's do let's do this ridiculous dictionary. Um, so we've got my car, and let's call this random dict. Okay, and let's talk about m merging these two dictionaries. So my car and random dict. Um, so first of all, yeah. So for this, you can use the dot update method. So you just, if you're familiar with how extend works, if you're familiar with how extend works, update works in a very similar way in that it kind of extends the first, the dictionary you call it on with the dictionary that you pass to update. So it takes a dictionary as an argument and extends the dictionary that you call it on. So this, again, this is a mutable operation. Cool. Uh, can you use range and len for iterating through dictionaries? 
Um, you could do like len you could get like dictionary dot keys and then do len of that I, th I think that gives you a len if it doesn't you can cast it I know for sure you can cast it as a list and then get the len of that list and then pass that to a range um, so you could do that with dot keys dot values or dot items um, but probably what I would do instead is enumerate. Let's look at that. It's interesting. So we'll do for uh, idx comma, and now we need these parentheses, key comma value in enumerate uh, enumerate um, my car. We'll do my car. So um, the reason that I need these parentheses here, let me just sh show you. This still enumerate gives me back a tuple, right? And it has two things in it. It has, oops, and you got to do dot items. Like I said, always use dot items, right? Then I forgot to use dot items. Okay, so enumerate gives you back a tuple with the enumeration and the uh, uh, the element that of the thing that you're enumerating uh, dot items gives you back a tuple of keys and values of a dictionary right so in this case the list of elements that you're passing to enumerate is uh, you could think about it as it's not it's technically not a list but you can think about it as a list of key value pairs in tuples so the element is another tuple so if I print this tuple out you can see its structure is let me see if I can isolate a line here right so it, it's a nested tuple so it, it gives me the index and then the key and the value right so in order to unpack this I have to do IDX and I can't do you know the next value if I call this element right then element is going to be this inner tuple right but I don't I don't want to do that I want to unpack element so I have to say go inside of that tuple and give me the key and the value like that now element doesn't exist we will do that so there's key value and here is index so if I wanted and index is wrong because it's not indexable but um, let's call this uh, uh, enum for enumeration so if I wanted like a, a rolling uh, ordinal count to go along with iterating through my dictionary this is how i would do it rather than using range len which is the reason that i could think that i would that you would want to use range len is to have like an ordinal count go through something um this is how you could use enumerate to do the same thing um so update can be used to merge dictionaries. Yes, and dictionary order won't change though, right? Yes, it won't change. Things get a little funky with update because what if the what if the two dictionaries have the same key but different values of that key? I'll let you play around with that. It would take it would take the last one, yeah. So it would take the one that you uh, passed into the parentheses as a parameter. Cool. All right, we got through all those questions. I know that was really fast. I feel like it was really fast, at least. Um, we we have this last one. I'm going to use it as a segue into sets. We're already past half time. Um, we've talked so much about tuples. I'm going to leave tuples for last. 
today. We might not get to them, but we've talked about them kind of implicitly. They've come up so much here and there, um, and they're really not terribly complicated. If you know how to use lists, when it comes time for you to learn to use tuples, I mean, they're really similar. So um, you, you can kind of see kind of how they're being used in, in Python uh, with all these tuples that we're seeing. So um, let's take a five minute break. Um, let's just reconvene at 24 minutes after the hour, at which time we will continue by talking about sets. Hopefully we'll have time for tuples as well. All right, and we're back. <clears throat> okay. Let's segue into talking about sets. Dictionaries versus sets. So um, the question originally was something along the lines of when would I use a dictionary versus a set? There is a similarity between dictionary keys and a set. I mean, you could you can kind of think of a set as a dictionary without values. Um, so I'm trying to think of. I just randomly remembered a, a Python joke. It was, uh, what's the most unscrupulous data type in Python? It's a set because it's like a dictionary without values. So anyways, but it, it is. It's like a dictionary without values. So if you, if you take what you know about a dictionary and you just take the values away, you're left with just the keys. That's kind of what a set is. A set obeys similar rules. The keys in the dictionary uh, have to be hashable, which means they have to be immutable, um, which also means they have to be unique. So only immutable types, only unique keys, meaning no duplicates. And that's true for sets, uh, only un unique immutable types or unique immutable values. Um, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's look at sets. I, I'm going to reframe this as, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll make a tuple of things versus set dict list and uh, tuple versus sets, right? So like I said earlier, I alluded to this. Well, I guess more, more than alluded, I said it. Uh, most of the times where you can use either a dict or a list or a tuple, you can use uh, a dict or a list or a tuple. You can interchange these fairly, fairly easy, right? Some some problems make a lot more sense with a dictionary or make a lot more sense with a list. Lists and tuples are just really similar, you know. So there's a lot of interchangeability here. You might have to reimagine something. Um, something might be more or less intuitive with one of these types, but you know, given that they these three store arbitrary elements and have a mechanism for retrieving those elements, i.e., a um, an index or a key, right? And keys don't feel like ind indices and they function a little differently, but they exist for the same purpose, which is to retrieve the values at that location, right? You think about them as just as like an address, right? The, um, the, the, the value of my house is me and my roommates and my uh, stuff, and the key is the address, right? So, um, or the address is more, maybe more accurately an index, Right, uh, you could view the address of your house as perhaps either, depending on how you want to look at it. Right. So, in either case, even though the you know dictionaries 
feel different from lists and tuples because keys feel different from indices, keys and indices exist more or less for the same reason, to, to help you retrieve the elements associated with them, even though if, even if it's through a slightly different feeling mechanism. Um, sets don't have that ability. So once we put elements into a set, we don't retrieve them. They're not useful for storing things uh, which we later want to like search through and then retrieve specific elements. Um, if I know some of you are thinking probably like, well, why would I ever want to use them? Um, if you want to use, if you want something where you, you need to like store elements and retrieve them, you have lists and tuples and dictionaries. You have plenty of options there. Um, if you want something that acts like a set, lists and tuples and dictionaries don't act like sets. Sets have some really cool features um, uh, that can be really beneficial. So let's do, uh, let's just make a set. So I'm going to call it my set equals. Now, to this point, and we haven't gone over tuples, but to make an empty tuple, you do this. Um, to make an empty list, you do this. To make an empty dictionary, to make an empty number, uh, whatever, you know, empty string. E each of the types kind of has a, uh, a literal form associated with it. So sometimes you'll see sets surrounded in curly brackets. If I try to make an empty set in with empty curly brackets, Python's going to think I'm making an empty dictionary not an empty set. So what I want you to do when you declare an empty set, you can do set like this. Just call the set function and that'll return an empty set. So if I print my set, you can see it's just gonna print set just like that, right? Um, if you wanna add things to your set, you can do um, my set dot add, right? So this is like append. But append specifically, like the word append specifically means to add to the end of. Well, sets don't have an order. So where's their end? There isn't an end. Um, sets don't have an order. So since they don't have an order, an index would be meaningless. Like, we, I guess we could have an index, but, you know, the third index isn't associated with anything that's going to be the same between calls, so it's just going to give you a random element. So sets don't have order, so indices don't really make sense, so they don't have indices, and they don't have keys because they're kind of like dictionaries without values, so they're kind of like the keys part of a dictionary. So what sets are what sets are useful for is set operations, set analysis. So if I want to add something to this set, um, let's just say hello. print that set real quick. So now that set has hello in it. Um, and if I want to, let's say I want to initialize this set with um, different elements, uh, you can just pass a list into it. Uh, somebody's asking, can dictionaries have duplicate keys? No, they cannot. Uh, and we've got another question sets don't have order but won't they stay in the order inputted um sometimes <laughs> sometimes they will sometimes they won't um don't count on it um so let's do this uh 55 77 Yeah, see, so I got these out in a different order. Oops. It's funny because, oh, well, now, now we are getting a different order. It's like it's maintaining an order. The order is arbitrary. I don't know if you're noticing this, but I'm running my code, and it's, it's maintained, I think it's maintained this order every single time. 33, 99, 77, 55. But that is not the order that I that I put them in with. So it's, I don't know why it's maintaining that order. 
it's really stuck on that order. The order of the second one is coming out different every time, right? So the, the moral of this story is don't count on it. Never count on your set having an order that you think you can predict because probably you can. I've never seen this particular behavior either. And that's, you know, like set order isn't random, it's arbitrary. It, Python is going to figure out whatever best way it think whatever way it thinks is best to store and retrieve the information and maybe that's the order that you put the things in and it it might be because it might be the case that the best way to store that information is the you know is the order in which python parsed it it's likely that the best way to store and retrieve that information really is the order that you put things in, but it's not guaranteed. And sometimes you can see this, I don't know, I, I'm mystified why we're getting this order, right? Zero, one, two, three, right? I, I'm mystified why we're getting that order, but it's just par for the course with sets. We're getting a different order than we put in, but it's also consistent. It's this, It's been the same every single time I've run it. So this one is different, but consistent. This one is different and inconsistent. And that's, so never, <laughs> never expect that you know uh, the order of a set because yeah, they're weird. So sets are weird. They're not for storing things that you're gonna loop through and then retrieve. You can loop through a set, but whatever you're doing better not be dependent on things being in a certain order because it's not going to matter. Um, okay. We got a couple questions. Let me catch up with questions. Uh, when we work with data sets like time series, don't, does that mean those aren't ordered data? Um, like time series data? Well, if it's in a set, it won't be ordered. Um, yeah. Um, if the if you're working with data and you know you're working with time series and the order in which events happen in time matters, then you better use a, a data type that preserves the order. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, don't count on, yeah, okay, that, we're not seeing your console, you're not seeing my console window? Are people not seeing where I have selected here at the bottom? You can see it? Okay, I think it's just you. Um, I think maybe just try resizing the zoom window or something. But yeah, it's down here where I have selected. Okay, good. <coughs> um, all right. So if sets aren't useful for preserving order, if they can't have duplicates and if you can't retrieve elements, from them, why the heck would you ever want to use one? Um, let's print dear set. So there's there's a bunch of good methods. Some of them you'll recognize. Add is syn uh, synonymous with append. Uh, clear and copy, do what you think they do if you understand them from lists. Sets are, are mutable. Um, pop does something similar. It removes an element, remove, removes an element. Um, let's see. So there's a few good ones in here that are, that are different. Um, so union, intersection, and difference are the ones. These are the really useful ones. So 
the reason that sets are useful and they are very useful when you need them they are wonderful and you'll see why they're structured in the way that they are so let's call this uh, set one and set two and let's say it has um, Okay, so these two sets have some elements in common and they each have some elements that are unique, right? And union, intersection, and difference are gonna help us kind of understand comparisons between sets. So let's print, um, I'm gonna say set one dot union set two and this is going to return a set that is all of the elements in both set one and set two um, so notice that none of the values are duplicated right so it gives me a superset of set one plus set two it is the set of both of these sets together and it's going to work whether I do set one, set two, or set two, set one. It's going to give me the same thing. Same as above. Okay, um, intersection. So intersection is going to show me all of the elements in set one that are also in set two. And again, it works the same way. Either way you do it. So intersection are the elements in common between the two sets. Um, the next one is difference. And difference does matter the way that you do it, the order that you do it in, right? So difference is gonna give you a, a different result, whether you do set one, difference set two, or set two, difference set one, right? So if you do it this way, it's gonna tell you all of the elements that are, are in set one that are not in set two. So all of the elements that are exclusive to set one, that are only in set one. And vice versa, if I do set two dot difference set one, it's gonna tell you all of the elements that are only in set two and not in set one. So it's, it's kind of the opposite of intersection. So union is uh, both of them together. Intersection is the elements that are in common. And then difference are the, di the ones that are in one but not the other and uh, gives you a different result depending on the order that you do it in. Cool. Let's see. Um, any questions about sets? I'm just gonna, we'll just wait a minute here. If there's any questions about sets. The floor is open for questions about sets. When would you need the complement of a set? Um, difference is the complement. Um, and you'd 
need it like when you want to know you know what's the what's the opposite what's in one that's not in the other essentially fairly straightforward yeah they are a bit straightforward they have their niche the way i think about them is like it's a very important niche it doesn't come up maybe not as often as like dictionaries as and lists where you're kind of doing just general data processing but when you want to do you know if you want to know all the elements that are present in one thing that's not the other thing you can use sets oh gosh i totally forgot to mention that it's kind of implied here so i, I kind of in my head i was like i didn't think to mention it but a lot of times working with sets looks like working with lists like if you want to do some accumulation process you can do it in a list there are times when accumulating into a set is more efficient since it can't have duplicates um, you can yeah it's just easy to accumulate or let more efficient to accumulate it into something where you're not actually writing duplicate data if you don't need to right um, so set accumulation is a thing and you'll use dot add instead of dot append for lists but so keep that in the back of your mind but in in general what you can do is work with lists and then cast them as sets with the set i mean that's exactly what i'm doing here on these three set lines we're making a set uh, you're saying complement is the same as difference, like not x is the same as what difference? Well, think about it like this, like complement, like um, you think about it like a complement, like one minus something, like um, it's the, you're, you're always working with a set, like one minus 0 0.7 is 0 0.3, 0 0.3 is the complement of 0 0.7. So what you're doing is you're saying um, what's different about one from 0 0.7, right? You have a set of, let's say floats uh, between zero and seven, or zero and 0.7, uh, and then a set of floats between zero and one, and you want to know the complement of 0.7. It's if we think about them as sets, it'd be one dot difference 0.7. But you know, obviously those are floating point numbers. But it's essentially when you th when you're thinking of complement, you'll end up using difference. Like the complement of one is zero. Um, all the numbers that are in the space uh, zero to one that are not in one are in zero. Which means it's an empty set, but still difference so complement and difference are sort of synonyms um yeah not sure not sure how to explain that further cool um i do want to move on and give some give tuples some air time with this how to calculate symmetric difference um, is that a method? I guess like that. Hm. Yep. Okay. There you go.
Um, okay. So let's talk about tuples real quick. We've got a little more than 10 minutes. I know we've talked about them, so this should go pretty quick. Um, so tuples are like lists, but they're immutable. So you might think, well, why would I ever want to use a tuple? The reason is maybe you want a set of tuples. Um, you might think, well, why, why wouldn't I just have a set of lists? You can't have a set of lists because lists are mutable and you can't have mutable objects in your set just like you can't have mutable objects as a key in a dictionary i have used tuples as keys in dictionaries before i've i've found that useful um a number of times actually i've used tuples as keys in dictionaries it's a little funky and it's a it's a pretty weird data structure and i'm always every time i've done it i'm like i don't know if this is the best way to do this I'm always kind of second guessing myself because it's a little weird, but um, I've done it and it's a thing. So tuples can be used as keys in dictionaries because they, they can be hashed because they're immutable. Um, another example is, let's say you have a tuple and you want to unpack it. Um, a, B, C. A, B, C. Well, however many things I'm unpacking, better f I better know how many things I'm unpacking from the get-go, right? If this were a list, well, I can unpack a list. That's fine. That's legal to do. But what else is also legal is, well, this is now a list, um, list.append, hello. And now I broke my, um, uh, I broke my uh, unpack right here. So since lists can be mutated, they're more prone to change, which means they're less predictable and parts of your code that count on, for example, size being precise and predictable or other elements being pr predictable um, lists aren't, you don't have, you can't make the guarantees about predictability that you can with sets. Um, you might think, well, you know, tup is just a name, you know, you can't guarantee that tup isn't going to be um, appropriated by something and just changed, and that's true. Right, like that can happen too. I could reassign this. Um, I can concatenate. If you know about concatenation with lists or strings, it's very similar with uh, tuples. So I can concatenate another tuple, and this is somewhat like an append, but I'm not mutating the tuple, I'm mutating the identifier. So, you know, something like this could happen, but what definitely cannot happen is. If I pass this tuple to a, a function, the function can get can do various concatenations and um, things with the tuple. None of them will change the tuple, so nothing else has agency to change this. There's there's no part of my code that will will break this. So if this part of the code is broken, it's definitely because at some point. I used the same name and reassigned a different value to it. So the what that's good news because if you have a tuple and the size of your tuple isn't what you need it to be, it's your fault, which is good because that means it's easy for you to to fix. It's code that probably you wrote. So um, it's not what I mean by that is. You know, if you import a library and pass a list to that library uh, or pass a list to a function from that library, that function has the agency, technically, to mutate that list. Generally, you don't want to write functions that way, but sometimes you might because efficiency might be uh, an important part of of what that library does, you know? So you might be trying to save space if you're operating on a really large 
a mutable type, you might do that operation in, in place and cause a mutation to that type. Um, whereas when you're dealing with tuples, you just have a guarantee that they're gonna always be how you left them. And if they're not, it's because you did this. It's because you, you used the same name and you set it equal to something else, which means you can go find that and fix it. So you you have a you have an idea of exactly what's causing the problem if it's not what you thought it was. Okay. Um, so let's just talk about let's talk about how to make an empty tuple. So you might think you make an empty tuple like this. And that's not a bad guess. Um, but this is actually going to be invalid. Oh, that's actually the problem. Oh, is this, is this now a valid? No way. This has to be new. I'm sorry. I get this mixed up. So to make an empty tuple, you use parentheses. I'm, I'm being silly. Um, to make an, a tuple with a single element in it, you have to put a comma after it. If I don't put the comma, it's going to think, yeah, it's going to think that um, I, I meant the integer four, right? So if you have a tuple with a single element in it, it still has to have one comma in it. So empty tuple is empty parentheses, comma with a single element is or tuple with a single element still requires a comma. Tuple with multiple elements just feels like a list, right? And we can mix and match types. We can, um, we can even put lists in there. So yeah, so they're very similar to lists. What, what we can't do is any sort of mutable operation to them, which I know I've said a bunch of times at this point. Um, so let's look, at, let's look at the directory for tuples. And if we do that, we'll notice there's only two regular named methods. You still got a, all, the, um, all the dunder methods and things like that, but we're, we're ignoring those for now. So you've only got two methods, count and index. And if I did, um, let's say if I did the deer for, <coughs> for list, real quick, let's go through these. The deer for list. Now let's go through and find all the mutable ones and all the immutable ones. We'll just delete all the ones that are, oops, that are, that cause a mutation. Okay, so um, this is the directory for lists. So append causes a change to the list. Clear does also. Copy doesn't cause a change to the list, but it's only useful in the context of mutability. Because if the if the thing can't change, then there's not really a point in duplicating it. If it can change, then you really might want to create a duplicate of it somewhere. Uh, count is not mutable. That's the one we have for for tuples. Uh, extend uh, causes a mutation similar to append. Index is another tuple method as well. Uh, insert, pop, remove, reverse, sort, all causing mutation. So I just deleted all the mutable methods for lists and I'm left with the tuple methods. So quite literally, tuples are just like lists just with the mutable stuff taken away. Um, so remember, they're useful for those times when you want your data to be predictable. They have a slightly smaller footprint uh, than lists too, although, you know, if you're, 
you know, using using them um, in your code, like something quick to iterate through, you know, like a small list and a small tuple are not things that you're really worried about, like blowing out your, your memory uh, on your machine or like slowing your computer down. A few small tuples or a sm few small lists aren't gonna hurt anything, um, but they are technically slightly more optimal than a list because they're a simpler type. Um, okay, so you might think since they're immutable that we can't do accumulation, but we can. Um, so tuples support concatenation. So I can say print tup plus uh, now just like concatenating anything, um, you have to concatenate it against its own type, right? So if I want to add hello, I have to add I have to add a tuple that contains the word or contains hello, contains the value that I want to add to it. So if I do that, it'll print that. If I do this world, it'll do that. Right? So those didn't cause a change to tup, but what I can do is similar to kind of integer numeric accumulation. Um, you know, if I have a num equals to zero, um, integers and floats are immutable types too, but we accumulate on those all the time. We'll do num equals num plus one, right, which gets, uh, which we usually will write as num plus gets one. These are the same. And we can do the same thing with tuples. So I could say tup plus gets hello. And now it's a single element tuple, so I got to have that comma in there. Uh, and I can say tup equals tup plus world. And you can see it's it sort of feels like uh, integer accumulation. And that's because integer accumulation doesn't mutate the integer and tuple accumulation don't mutate the object, the integer or tuple object. They mutate the pointer to that object, right? With the equal sign. And the equal sign is the thing that does it. So just as usual, the I mean, I can change the value of that variable, no problem. Um, but I can't change the, I can't make a change to the tuple on, to the, the tuple on the object level. I can't change the object itself. That's immutable. So you can see we can accumulate hello and world individually. You can imagine this happening in a loop in various circumstances. So you can do tuple accumulation. Um, if you wanted to, although you might as well do, if you really wanted a tuple, you might as well do list accumulation and then turn it into a tuple at the end when you want it to be a tuple. So you could totally do that as well. Okay, cool. So we're just a couple minutes over time, um, but we managed to get through everything, barely and with a little bit over time. So I'm gonna wrap up there. Thanks everybody for your patience. I'll take this question uh, um, about complement and difference um, if it's still on the table. Um, cool. Let me stop the recordings and we'll open up for questions.